Our speaker tonight is Sebastian Kennernecht, who is an award-winning wildlife and conservation photographer. He did his bachelor's at UC Santa Cruz in Ecology and Evolution, and he's an associate fellow with the International League of Conservation Photographers. He's been visually covering wildlife and environmental issues internationally for over 14 years. He has produced photos, time lapses, videos, and web content that has been featured in numerous outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, BBC Wildlife, Smithsonian, The Economist, Science, and many, many more. Uh, we at SFBBO have also had the pleasure of working with him. He has taken photos of our Plover work, and uh, he's also donated some of his prints, uh, which will be actually featured this fall during our California Fall Challenge. That's our yearly fundraiser. So those will be available for our auction. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and you can be a lucky owner of a Sebastian Kennernecht print. So I think without further ado, um, welcome Sebastian and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the very nice introduction, Serena. And thanks everybody for joining today. Um, as Serena said, as I'm going through the presentation, please just put your questions in the chat because it's much easier oftentimes to answer questions on the spot as I'm talking about whatever I'm talking about rather than at the end, though we will leave some time at the end as well for questions. Uh, I'm gonna try to do this from outside today just because I've been inside all day. And as I'm sure many of you can relate, being an outdoor person, uh, I just need to feel a little bit of sunshine. So if the wind's too loud, uh, Serena, just let me know and I'll move inside. But uh, otherwise, I'm just gonna jump right into it. The aim of the talk today is just to kind of give you a little bit of an introduction of bird photography. We're gonna dive really, really deeply into it next week and get very specific with things. So if this is something that interests you or after today that's something that interests you, then please um, sign up for that workshop. But as I said, ask the questions away and we'll see if we can get to everything that you're wondering about. Okay, so um, this is one of my first bird photographs ever, uh, morning dove in, uh, in the East Bay in Fremont. I, I grew up in the Bay Area, so this is my home. Um, I wanna get, some, get you guys to think from something like that last photo to something like this black skimmer photo. Photography can be just, you know, a snapshot that allows you to be like, oh, I saw the species and I can put it on my list. But it can be so much more than that. It, it, it's really this powerful tool for storytelling. So really the first thing I want you to think about because what photography is, is, is you're capturing light. And when you're capturing light, there's three different positions to the sun that you can have that emphasize different things about a photograph. So this is what we would consider front light where the sun is directly behind you as the photographer, so in my case would be behind me and the bird would be in front of me. And, um, and what this lighting called front lighting emphasizes is color. And this is actually, I wanna point, this is, there's a reason I put this photo in as one of the first photos ever is because this is, you know, this photo still gets used professionally all the time, it gets published. This was taken on a camera from 2003 that was like six megapixels with the kit 300 millimeter lens, like the most, the cheapest equipment you can buy. And uh, so it's not just about having the latest and greatest equipment. Yes, that makes your life a lot easier, but and, and photography can be so inhibitive budget wise that I don't want you guys to think, oh, I need to invest in all of this equipment first before I can dive into bird photography, shoot with what you got. Um, so. Like I said, front lighting emphasizes color, just like these sandhill cranes here in Bosque del Apache in New Mexico. And now when you have the sun at a 90 degree angle to you, and so the sun is a 90 degree angle to you and the bird and your subject, then you emphasize texture. You can really see that here in the rock as well as the feathers and th throat pouch of this branch cormorant that is in its courting plumage. Just by the way, uh, is taken in Point Lobos, and uh, it's a great place to go see the birds and get quite, be quite close to them in a safe way um, and see their whole courting and nesting and chick rearing behavior. So 
great local, pretty local spot to check out. Again, side lighting emphasizes texture. Now compare that to back lighting, that is when the sun is directly in front of you with the subject between you and the sun, that emphasizes, it's this, it produces a silhouette, but it emphasizes the shape. So that's great for when you're wanting to show species that have unique bills like the sunbird or the sandhill cranes. You know, you're definitely simplifying the image, but you're just telling a slightly different, different point. So before I even jump into that, the one thing I, get, I want you to think about whenever you're taking photographs is why am I taking this photograph? What is the story or point I want to make by taking this photograph? And then everything compositionally, settings, and the things we're gonna talk a little bit about today that add to that point, include it. Everything that distracts from that point, take it away, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit, but that's kind of the overarching idea I want you to have in the back of your mind as we're going through this today. So exposure, that's literally just the amount of light coming into your camera. Uh, it's really important to, to think about because just look at this comparison here between uh, the camera would have wanted me to take this photograph like this, just that's based on how it meters the situation, which is a little bit too complicated for us to talk about right now. But when you're, thinking about how I, do I want to expose the shot? How much light do I want to let, the let into the camera? This photograph obviously has a different impact than this one. This one's much more contrasty and it, it, um, it's much more impactful, but I had to make the choice of doing that. But the way those things are done is shutter speed, aperture and ISO. But again, that's something we would wanna cover in the workshop rather than today, at least in in, in detail, I'm gonna talk a little bit about them today. The thing is, and this is why photography is amazing because photography is subjective, it's not objective. You know, you might think this photograph is better than this one. And so when you, I want you to shoot the way you wanna shoot and you wanna experiment and there is no right, there is no wrong. Uh, this is how you want to do it. So what, the way I like to think about photography, bird photography, and wildlife photography in general is, let me push the envelope. This is a photo that maybe 99% of photographers would throw away. But to me, it's a really cool abstract of a snow goose flying in New Mexico. So this is a conscious decision I made after about half an hour of shooting. I was like, oh, let me just try something else. I've kind of got the standard shots. Let me, see how else I can show the subject really, snow geese. Um, they're white. Let me blur the, uh, blow out the background as well, the overcast cloudy background that they're flying against. So th those are things I just want you to think about when you're taking images. So let's talk a little bit about specifics. Shutter speed. Shutter speed is just the amount of time that you're allowing light to come into the camera. So the effect that has on an image is freezing or showing motion. And this is kind of what most bird photographers go for in the beginning is they wanna freeze motion. This is probably a two thousandths of a second for those of you who are interested in the numbers. This means everything is tack sharp. There's, no, there's not enough time for this bird, to, uh, for the sandhill crane to fl fly and, and make motion in the image based on the amount of time and letting light come into the camera, one two thousandths of a second. So I'm freezing motion here, just like this, again, snow goose. But for me, this is kind of the standard shot. Now let me start thinking about how else can I photograph this? Let me start slowing down the shutter speed. So this is um, probably a 60th of a second, maybe one one hundredth of a second even. These guys, as you all know, have pretty rapid wing beats. But you can see the face is still quite sharp. But I'm showing you, the viewer can see, hey, there's motion going on. I can tell it's flying. It's not just a frozen thing that could be dangling from a string in a way. But this bird is definitely moving its body to, to, to fly, which is what we love so much about birds. Serena, you have a question? 
Yeah, we have a question, I think, related to the earlier snow goose photo that you showed where it was kind of, uh, yeah, that one. Um, the question is, was that post-processed with the raw file or a choice you made in the field? Choice I made in the field. If you guys ever have the chance to go to Bosque del Apache, it, it is definitely overrun uh, by birders, which I have no problem with. I mean, I'm one of them, but uh, there's a reason for that. It's because there's, I think, 40,000 snow geese and 15,000 sandhill cranes there. And when they talk, uh, take off in the morning, it's like thunder going off. It's, it's something you do have to experience if you have the, if you have the opportunity to. But so for me, again, when I'm shooting, I'll kind of get the safe shot first, this one. And then I start experimenting. My kind of rule about photography is 20, 60, 20. 20% 20 safe shot, 60% start trying more abstract philosophies about photography. And then the last 20 go really, really abstract. Um, so this was a decision I made in the field. I overexposed it after I had already gotten the stuff in the can as film photographers used to say, uh, I, I just started trying different things. Some, most things don't work, some things to me worked. And then a couple of follow-up questions. So can you remind us what place was that with all the snow geese? It's called Bosque de la Pache. And it's near Albuquerque, New Mexico. And the best time to go is in the winter time. Awesome, thanks. And then uh, can you also repeat that formula again, the 20? Yeah, 20, 60, 20. I'll talk about that more in the workshop. And you'll probably hear that as, a, uh, as an answer today repeatedly, but... Um, so yeah, 20% kind of your safe shots, 60% take some risks, the last 20% take some extreme risks, which is kind of what I'm getting more towards here, right? So now I'm really slowing down at shutter speed. I'm shooting at a 10th of a second, maybe an eighth, 15th, somewhere around there. And uh, I'm really, you're not getting all the sharpness in the bird, but that's almost not the point anymore, right? Now we're moving towards more, it's almost more like rock art than it is photography, but you're getting, you're understanding what's happening still. So the sky is the limit, um, pardon the pun with birds, but uh, you're, you're, limit, you're limitless in terms of the possibilities, just like this shot. This is a mixed flock of, of shorebirds. Um, actually, while I was with SS, as FBBO, I shot this. And again, you don't, I'm not showing you what species there are, but that's not really the point here. We've all seen that view, right? The flock of the birds flying over the water as, you know, maybe a dog scared them off or something scared them off. And so that's, you know, this is just a, a different way of, of um, depicting this, this, what is to us a pretty common sight, at least to us bird watchers, birders. Now, I told you earlier, um, think about the point you're trying to make and then simplify it. So this is a shot of a brown pelican, you know, fast shutter speed, um, nice and crisp flying over the Pacific Ocean. But to me, it was more about the bird flying over the ocean than really seeing all the details. You can see my mouse, right? Serena, if you can give me a nod, cool. Um, you can see this kelp here. And it's not super distracting, but let's say I just wanted to simplify it even more. What I can do is what's called panning, which is a technique where you move at the same exact speed as your subject. And you see this a lot in car advertisements where the car is perfectly sharp. The background has, these, has the blurry streaks that shows you, oh, this car is going fast. Well, Pelicans can do it better in my opinion. Um, but you can also see how it slows down uh, and simplifies the background. You don't see any of the texture in the waves that was actually there, right? Because there's, you're letting light come in for a longer period of time, a slow shutter speed. Again, this is about an, a 10th of a second, a 15th of a second, that this becomes non-detailed. Um, and you can really just focus on the bird and you realize that it's flying over because you can get to see the motion here in the background. Uh, again, here and in condor, same technique, sharp photo, pan photo. Bird's still perfectly sharp. So 
this is a technique I would say, once you have your sharp photos down, try this and just realize that your keeper rate is going to be one in a thousand. But this is why it's great that we have digital because um, there you're going to have a lot of, it's just really hard to keep the camera moving at the same exact speed as the bird. But try it on cars first, try it on people walking. Um, it helps with it's people you know, so they don't get freaked out. Um, but um, yeah, it's a great technique, fun way to, uh, to show the birds in flight. Now, uh, aperture, that's you know, just the size of the opening of the, of the lens, but that's not so important. What's really important is aperture controls, how much of the background you get to see, it's called depth of field, how much of the photo is sharp. And so here you can see that this plover is sharp, Back, uh, the foreground's pretty out of focus, and then the background's really out of focus. That's a small um, f-stop, that's f4, f5.6. Uh, that's a really, really easy way to simplify the photograph. You know, there was a lot of detail in this, in, in the background here in the tidal um, area that this bird was in, but by shooting at this aperture, I'm really just letting you show the bird see the bird and not showing you what's distracting around it. At the same time, just like the shutter speed, this is kind of the default for bird photography. We can do the opposite and really op what's called opening up, which just, I mean, closing down, which just means a, a large f-stop, f-22, f-16, where I get to see more than just this cute little Laison albatross on Midway Atoll, but I get to see all of its fledgling partners here. They look like a gang of misfits. Um, but you, you can see how I'm telling two different stories here. It's, it's you know, one individual, really more about, I'm not really showing you any environment versus this, this is a bird, uh, one of many birds ready to, to leave its um, birthing grounds. Now, let's talk about composition a little bit. <clears throat> so this is just how we frame our subject. This is a cool bird, but it's a very boring photograph. And the reason for that is because I placed this cool osprey right in the center of the frame. And there's two, uh, two things to note about photography. I want you guys to all trust me for a second and close your eyes for a few for just one second. Close your eyes. I can't see you, but close them. Now open them. And where did your eye go? It went right to the center of the frame and it goes to the brightest part of an image. So your eye probably went right here. Now, for those of you on social media, this is kind of the good Instagram test. The way you can think about photography is how do you wanna create a photograph that gets people to stop and look at it? Well, or you know, when we're scrolling through Instagram, we're scrolling up, we're scrolling up, and we just keep flying by all of these photographs. And why are, are we not stopping? Because they're not engaging us. And part of that sometimes is because of uh, compositions that aren't interesting. So if you're if you're providing the viewer something that they naturally want to do already, aka your eye goes to the center of the frame of the photograph naturally, or it goes to the brightest part of an image. Here, I'm doing both. And have the brightest part of an image and my subject right in the center, you're gonna look at this image and fly right past it. It's, it's just not a very engaging composition. It's not wrong, it's just not super engaging. So instead, what you generally wanna think about is placing your subject to the side. And especially if you can give the subject space to look into. This is a reef heron in Yemen you can see how it's looking into the tidal area that it is wading through. Um, so I'm, I've moved it off center and you can also see this is a pretty slow shutter speed. There's motion in the leg here, but I've simplified it by, you don't get to see all the texture in the water that was there if I had used a really fast shutter speed. There was a high chance that he was going to be at, out of focus because I was using a slow shutter speed, but again, 20, 60, 20 rule after my first 20, you know, I took five frames like this. It was per perfectly sharp. I'm like, okay, that's, I don't need a hundred shots of the same thing. Let me change my settings a little bit. 
Same thing here, long bill dowager. Um, let it walk into the frame. So here I've placed it at the top of the frame and it's coming down into the frame. I'm giving the viewer the space to see where the bird is walking, waiting to, okay? That's a, and I've moved it, I moved it at least off center from, from here to the top. Serena, you have a question for me? Yeah, so in the, the photo before, two photos before this one. So yeah, this one, um, what was, uh, can, what do you, what, what I guess was the slow shutter speed that you used in that case? Uh, the numbers, so it's probably about one tenth of a second. Um, you know, that's something that just comes with time and practice is that move, sh photographing a swallow versus a pelican versus a red-tailed hawk, they're three different shutter speeds to capture the same thing. They move it, those birds move at different speeds. So freezing one bird, I have to, you know, to freeze um, the swallow, I have to use an extremely high shutter speed to freeze it. While a red-tailed hawk that's just circling, I don't have to use as fast of a shutter speed because it's just not going that fast. So same as the opposite spectrum, if I want to, if, um, you know, you just let's take an ostrich, for example, and it's walking, but I want to use that panning technique I talked to you and told you about where I want to um, move the camera at the same speed that the subject is moving, then I can use a slow, uh, I can use a, um, like, let's say, I would have to use a slower shutter speed, like a tenth of a second versus if it's running, just because it's moving faster. It's gonna cover more ground. So to show that blurriness in the background, there doesn't need to be as much time for the camera just to, be, uh, to stay open, to be engaged, because the bird is literally moving faster. So this guy, you know, you guys have seen, it's just like our egrets, this reef heron, like a snow egret slowly walking along the shore. That's all it's doing. So with time, you'd know, okay, to show a little bit of motion, I probably want to shoot that around a 10th. I don't know what the actual number is, but I could, you know, place a very safe bet that it's around that. Just from, this comes with time. So like, don't worry, it's digital. You're not, you know, you're not throwing away things by, uh, by trying different values of shutter speed. Any other questions for that? No, okay. All right, so then many of you I'm sure have probably heard of the rule of thirds. That's, is by, that's placing your subject at uh, a cross line of if you break the photograph down into thirds. So here's a third, here's would be two thirds, same horizontally and vertically. And it's just psychologists figured this out a long time ago. It's definitely not photographers is that it's just naturally pleasing to us to have your subject placed at the intersection of these lines, where these lines meet. And actually a lot of um, digital cameras nowadays offer you the opportunity to see this grid overlaid in your viewfinder. So if you're like, I don't know where the thirds are then, which is totally understandable, you just place that grid in, into your camera and you activate it. But also with time and cropping after the fact, you can just naturally get this kind of ratio. It doesn't have to be the full bird, you know. Um, and again, this is a very common species. You know, it's a mallard. It's a female mallard. And um, but the whole point of this image is the eye, right? Eye contact. And you can see it's pretty darn close to that intersection. So it's just naturally engaging. But just like I've been, uh, I'm gonna, I have been saying, I'm gonna conti continue saying is there's kind of these guidelines and then I want you to just push it, push the extremes the other way. Uh, this is a full, full, this is how I shot it with this much white space um, of this pied kingfisher in Zambia, just pushed the bird to the extreme of the composition. You know, the, oops, sorry. The one third uh, or the rule of thirds, that intersection would be right around where my mouse is. But especially because I have so much white space, I just wanted to make this composition a bit more extreme and I find it more engaging that way. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, equipment here. 
you can tell, and this is, I purposefully show this again, because when I started with bird photography, I, no way I was going to afford any of those really big telephoto lenses because, uh, you know, I was fresh out of college and that was <laughs> not going to happen. Um, so I want you to know it is quite possible to do bird photography with shorter, shorter millimeter lenses. But let's, let's start with the extreme and just show you how choosing different equipment means you're, sh you're telling different stories. So this is at 600 millimeters. That's one of those really big telephoto lenses you see on the side of sports events sometimes. Or if you go out with enough birders, you've, you've seen it out there because it's that's what birders a lot of times photograph with. So this is uh, taken at 600 millimeters. Uh, now a Ridgeways rail. It's a uh, for me when I photographed it was still called a California clapper rail, and um, really you can see that the point of this photograph is um, it's just the eye here, right? And I'm I, I'm having the viewer just connect kind of on an emotional level through having this very very what's called a shallow depth of field, just the eyes in focus, even you know, the front of the, the bill and the body of the bird is already out of focus. That's a very different story than uh, here where I'm starting. This is a 100 to 400 millimeter lens. Okay, this is often quite common around birders. I'm really starting to show you more of the, of the tidal marsh habitat that Rodriguez rails live in. But if you don't have that kind of lens, don't worry. With patience, I can guarantee you you can get some really cool shots that are, you know, very different storytelling than this. So this is with a 20, no, 70 to 200, probably around 70 millimeters, 80 millimeters. I'm really showing you this cool habitat that this bird lives in. You know, it's, a, well, it was endemic. I guess it's endemic to California, but um, it's a very different story and it, but it's a great photograph and this, this photograph gets used actually probably more so than the other one, more so than the really close up one. And this is taken with a 24 to 70. This uh, just series of photos was actually all on the same day within a span of an hour or so. Um, but I just sat in this, as you can see the, the tidal channel I'm sitting in here and I just let the bird do its thing. We'll talk about how to approach birds in a little bit, but um, you know, I didn't move and it was comfortable with my presence, but it also allowed me to show this bird in very different contexts via choosing very different lenses. So we went from a big 600 millimeter lens down to a 24 to 70. So if you have a kit lens, an 18 to 55, that's kind of the standard lens that your gear comes with when you, um, when you buy any kind of body, um, then then this photo would be quite possible. Yeah. Are you always shooting handheld or sometimes tripod? So at this point, I'm almost exclusively shooting handheld just because the technology of the lenses has gotten so much lighter. Um, but tripod is, is a fantastic option for, you know, especially if you're gonna be in an area, if you're waiting for a bird to show up, uh, then I used to shoot tripod. If I'm walking around, I tend to shoot handheld. If I know I'm going to be stationed at one spot, I tend to be try. Yeah, use a tripod. Sorry, I don't know if I said that right before, but um, just because I don't, you know, as if I'm not moving around, there's no point for me to hold this lens up continuously. And if it's on a tripod, then and a bird comes, I'm ready to go really quickly. Um, and in that case, again, gimbal head is quite useful for. Um, for, for movability with the subject. It's, it's a, just a very fluid um, ball head that allows you to move with your subject quite quickly. And maybe you'll cover this later, but another question that came up was how far away are you from these birds? Okay, so again, this is the same individual. Here, uh, I'm probably 15, I mean, 10 yards away. Um, and then maybe seven yards, probably actually still seven yards. And here I'm just maybe like six feet away, but I'm just sitting there. 
Um, most of the time with birds, I think, you know, uh, I think birders are naturally, we're naturally quite patient. Um, so if you can, if you can sit in a spot for a little while, that, that will be your best chance. And that's when you don't need those big lenses, especially they're helpful. I, I own one, I, I'm not saying they're not, but um, I just want to emphasize the point that anybody can do this with very accessible equipment or more accessible equipment, I should say. So, um, and yeah, I mean, I've heard, I've had puffins walk over me. Um, it's just a matter of, of um, and maybe I'll emphasize that a little bit in the, you know, getting close to birds because I know with bird, you know, when I hang out with birders, it's a very different thing. They just care about seeing the, seeing the bird um, while I'm interested in being close to the bird so I can get a good photograph of it. So it's a little bit different. We'll talk about that. Um, and maybe I'll go into a bit more specifics than I was planning to in that section. So this is a really, really, really big thing, backgrounds. Um, you know, we're so excited when we see a bird like this Brant's cormorant. We're like, ah, oh, Brant's cormorant, I'm really close, this is amazing. And we're so, uh, we're, we get, you know, this childlike fascination, which I think is incredible. And I do it all the time about whatever, whatever bird we're seeing. It's really, really important to think about your background. And remember, I had you guys do that eye test. If you did that here again, what would happen is that you would look everywhere but the cormorant. <laughs> just because your eye goes to the brightest part of an image, it would then quickly jump to the cormorant just because that's the only subject in here. But it's really important to think about what, how am I differentiating this cormorant from whatever is behind it? So what you'll see here. This is the same bird with me just walking around it. And I'm not saying it, I'm not telling you which one is the best one, but you can see they're very different. And every time the background's very blurred, this is probably to me the most complimentary, but um, this is just me moving around the bird. It's just having a different background, creating a little bit different photograph. Snow egret. Yeah. So uh, related to the that the eye, I guess, um, are you pumping color or a sharpness in in post processing, for instance, the eye on the cormorant? Yeah, that's another thing here. Um, no, I, I, I def I mean, contra I shoot in raw. So it's in raw, the, there's a, it's a much flatter image than if I shot in JPEG because in JPEG, your camera compresses the photograph. But yes, so in raw, you need to post-process, you need to bump the contrast to even make it look uh, natural. If, if you leave a raw in raw, it looks like you shot it on a very, very cloudy, misty day where everything just it doesn't look like there's any contrast. So you need to have contrast. I didn't bump the, uh, uh, the color in the eye at any, more, but so this is a good point. Here I'm shooting a little bit against the light, even though it's overcast. But you see how much duller the light, uh, the eye, and the light, the light in the eye is here versus here. And you can see I'm on the other side of the bird here. Um, so you can see, you can actually see the 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 sky up here in the reflection of the eye. So I didn't bump, uh, so I didn't change it at all. Um, it's just that's a good, actually a really good point about. The background can emphasize that here. Here it's kind of in between. Um, and the sharpness here, this is, sorry, uh, this is a bit sharper here than it is in this shot. And that's an autofocus thing that we'll talk about in the workshop too. I hope that was helpful. Okay, so you can see this sequence here. So this no egret kind of blends in and not like I really had a choice, but it's just a good set sequence of images to show you how the background can make a difference on your photograph. This is the same thing. You can see the Taiko Gobi it has in its bill is moving between shots. This is actually the before. This is a shot a little bit after. 
where a wave in the background came and crashed. But see how here it blends into the wave. Here, it really stands out against that dark blue um, of the Pacific Ocean. Again, here, um, this is a great horned owl in, in San Jose. And most of these shots are local, uh, which is also, we have amazing bird life around here, as you guys all know. Here, so I shot this female great horned owl. And then again, your eye goes to the brightest part of an image. If you close your eyes and open them, this is where they're gonna go. So literally by taking a few steps back and a few steps to my left, you can see it's the same branch. This is the branch it's sitting on. I'm it's taken 20 seconds apart. I'm just moving. So now instead of having that bright blue sky in the background, I now have this cliff that um, is behind this tree that's hit by the sunset light lit up. And it's so much more complimentary, especially including the eyes of the bird versus, um, versus this shot. And I even, even um, had a little bit of light in here. So you can see how that just makes a big difference by really being conscientious of your background. Now, this is another thing I see a lot of times when I'm, you know, I'm tutoring photographers or, or I'm helping them out. And uh, a really, really big thing, I used to work for Nat Geo photographer. This was like his pet peeve is to, you gotta take your eye and move it like I am with my mouse around the frame edge. And see if I saw if I had done that properly here, I would have seen that this brown pelican's ha head was sneaking into my shot. And you can see how distracting that is. Like maybe if I showed more of it, it would be less distracting. But here it's just like this, and it's bright, so my eyes naturally going to go to it. Uh, I go from this pelican to this guy, and I'm like, oh, this is bothersome. So literally by just shifting, same rock. You can see the same rock. Just shifting a little bit to my left. It's a bit, it's definitely more pleasing here because I don't have anything poking in from the edges that's distracting. And with birds, that's, you know, pelicans is one thing, but like, let's shoot, say you're shooting any passer and bird, that's, that's half of how you spend your time. It's just checking, oh, do I have a weird branch poking in from the side of the frame that's very distracting? Okay, so that's just something to be aware of. Yeah. Related to that, uh, we had someone ask uh, if you have any tips on focusing on those fast moving birds, especially through twigs and branches and things like that. Yeah, that, to get into that, we're gonna cover that in detail in the workshop. Um, the quick answer to that is single spot focus. And if you wanna Google that, that's go for it. But if you want the breakdown of that, we're gonna go super in detail uh, in the workshop, both in terms of uh, just how to get focused through the branches and how to nail focus of flying birds um, and getting those. We're gonna really dive deep for settings for the workshop. That's just not, it's a bit too technical for an intro class. Okay. And then another question was, are you shooting in full manual or aperture or shutter priority? Yeah, um, I shoot in, um, I don't shoot manual. I think that's, I only shoot a manual under extreme specific exposure conditions like nighttime. Otherwise I'm shooting in shutter speed or aperture generally in shutter speed priority. Um, well, actually it actually depends either shutter speed or aperture, but I'm, I'm using one of those because when you're moving your camera, there's no way you're keeping up uh, and you're shooting from the light again, uh, you know, to the side of the light against the light, your camera can't, you can't quickly turn enough the dials and manual to keep up with that. If you're shooting in shutter speed priority or aperture speed priority, then your camera is doing that for you. Again, there's some parameters to set for that. We'll talk about that in the workshop. Sorry that that's the answer to some of these questions. We just It's just that we have an hour today and we'll have, I think four hours for the workshop. Okay, and at the same point, um, backgrounds can be, you know, here we had a, a background element that was distracting, but at the same time, a background element can be so um, additive to the story you want to tell. Just like before I was saying, 
um, you know, you want to get rid of everything that doesn't add to the point you want to make, but you want to add everything that does. Here, I wanted to show this lesser rea. Um, I think they're also called Darwin's rea in Chile in this cool mountainous habitat that they live in this and this um, Patagonian, they, they call it pre-Andean shrubland is the habitat type. And, you know, I had photos of the bird just if I, if it, I'm going to draw this imaginary um, frame around it like this. And that's a cool photograph, but this tells, that photograph tells a very different story than me showing you the whole habitat it lives in, right? So, um, and so I had the option, you know, I had a bigger lens option. I actually took my smaller lens because I wanted to show more of the landscape. And so, um, you know, that was a very conscientious choice about showing this background that it lives uh, to then emphasize the habitat that it lives in. Same like this. Uh, I'm sorry, my, sorry guys, I'm at my sister's house and my uh, nephew just came home. I know. Okay, I gotta work, buddy. <laughs> um, and so the, the sun here, you know, it, it's, it's, an el it's a background element that adds to the composition of the photograph. Um, if, if I didn't have the sun here, sure, it'd be a nice silhouette, but this is an added element. It was a very conscious, just one. These, these skimmers are flying the whole time in this particular pattern. And that's one thing about wildlife photography. If you haven't done a bunch of it, you're all interested in birds. And the one, the number one tip I can give for wildlife photography is ob observe. And all of you guys do that already anyways, is observe, 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 because what you'll start noticing is patterns. And when you start seeing those patterns, then you can be like, okay, that means I'm gonna position myself this in this spot, because I know if I position myself here, then that's the angle I'll have on the bird, or maybe I'll come close to me eventually, because that's what it's been doing this whole entire time. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so, um, I noticed that these skimmers were flying in front of the sun continuously. So I was like, oh, I'd love to get that shot. I moved the boat a little bit and then was able to get the shot after a few minutes. You're getting a lot of skimmers here, but same here. These two skimmers in a way are a background element, but it's a nice compositional flow. You can see here between the three birds, right? Kind of leads your eye to the back, coming back to the front rather than if I just had this front skimmer, it'd be a nice photograph, but it would just be against blue sky and it wouldn't be as engaging as having these other two birds in the frame. Okay, so how to get close to birds. Most of you probably already know this, but let's talk about it in terms of wildlife, in terms of photography in general. There's the obvious way, um, which is like go full camo and, and uh, creep your neighbors out. Um, this is me wearing a, a ghillie suit and camera flash netting over a camera to get um, photographs of wildlife in Uganda, like this crested hornbill. Um, so that's one way. I, I don't think that's the most realistic way to be honest. So I'm just gonna kind of skip over that. This is a technique that a lot of bird photographers use. This is, these are blinds. Uh, these specifically are tra tragopan blinds which are a great way because you can even see there's some like uh, low level blinds if you want to get down to the eye level of the bird. And it's a great way of um, hiding your silhouette. This is a great strategy if you are extremely patient and are okay seeing the world in only like an inch hole at a time. I don't like blind work to myself, to be honest. It just... I, I'm sitting, lying in here and I'm wondering what's going on behind me here. <laughs> so uh, I think I just have too much FOMO. Um, but it, it is a great way of getting certain, especially sensitive situations like this. I'm in a blind, a custom built blind that's next to an American kestrel um, nest that's on the other side of the barn door. So the male here is coming into the, you can see the little nest whole so it's obviously human made but this way I'm only like you know nine feet away from it I'm not causing disturbance to the bird by uh 
by one being quiet uh, inside the blind and not being seen by the bird. This is another great way. This is not. This is a photo by Ron Dudley. Um, you can kind of hide yourself, hide your silhouette by just shooting out of your car. Um, one thing you can do here, you can see this is like a little um, pool noodle, styrofoam piece that kind of just one, there's two tips. One, turn your engine off if you can, uh, but this would even help with minimizing the vibration that will come through the car into your lens when you're photographing the birds. Um, but generally I would say turn off your engine but also just from you scratching your car and, and, and the lens and stuff, it's a nice little, some people use bean bags, sweater, you know, you don't have to go fancy. This is a shot I got in Northern California in Klamath in the winter time, just shooting out of my car. But most of the time, this is how I photograph wildlife. I'm just walking around. Um, again, not necessarily with such a big lens. I just didn't have any photos of myself with a smaller lens. So I had to pick this one. But it comes down to exactly what I was saying earlier is understanding behavior. So we're, I think as birders, we're pretty good at getting obsessed with something. So just like uh, we get obsessed with seeing a certain bird, let's get obsessed with no understanding the behavior of a bird. So, you know, trying to get a photograph of a pelican bathing is one thing, but, uh, trying to do it in the open ocean is going to be a lot more challenging than knowing, oh, these pelicans keep bathing themselves in these freshwater streams that come into the ocean. If I just hang out here, even maybe before they arrive, they'll, I know they'll come because I've seen it day after day after day. And again, we've talked about observing behavior and repetitive behavior and taking advantage of it. That's all I did here. I, I, uh, I used to live in Santa Cruz and I would bike by here and I would see these pelicans bathing in the creek right by the boardwalk. And, uh, and then I was like, well, I know this is gonna keep happening. I'm just gonna sit there, wait for them to come. I'm not moving. So uh, they know I'm not providing, you know, being a threat to them, they came. And, uh, you know, at first they were further away but eventually they came close and, and I got, was able to get this photograph here. Same, same, thing, same kind of strategy I use, use with shorebirds. We see this with shorebirds all the time where they, t they walk down the beach, you know, they're, they're foraging, but they're never just foraging in one area. The flock will generally have, they'll either walk left or right. Overall, it just might be slightly, um, but overall they're gonna keep walking right as they're foraging. So I'm just gonna go 50 yards down the beach and wait for them to come walk towards me. I'm not going to move. I'm going to wait. It's going to be really hard in the beginning to be like, oh, I want to be closer, but you got to have patience. And that will mean that I eventually they'll come right next to me. Another thing too, is if you see the tide coming in as they're feeding, just position yourself where you can tell that the birds aren't getting, they're not getting flushed. They're not walking away from you. So a safe distance, sit down and just wait for the tide to come basically push the birds to you because they're just going to keep being in the, in the zone where they're not right in the water. Yeah. Uh, so how long do you wait typically? Um, I mean, it depends a little bit on the bird uh, and the behavior, but I would say half hour, hour. So for me, it's just like, if I take this one shot, I'll be happy with it rather than, you know, a bunch of scared birds from 50 yards away. And then another different species flying away at 50 yards away. So it's about patience. And uh, in the, the previous photo with the pelican bathing, we had a question, how do you freeze the water droplets? Okay, right. So just like we had um, talked, we, I showed you that sandhill crane shot and that first snow goose shot where the, everything's frozen, that's a very fast shutter speed. So uh, very little amount of time for light to come into the camera. So what, how that relates to your numbers is if you're shooting in shutter speed priority, for example, you'd wanna ratchet the, that up to a two thousandths of a second, for example, okay? If you know there's a food source um, 
that birds like to continuously come back to. Again, this is just observing behavior and, and, and taking advantage of it. So, you know, seeing this toucan um, feed on these fruit on other, on other fruiting trees. I couldn't get close to those fruiting trees because they were the toucans were already on there. But so instead, so instead of trying to approach them and flushing them, I would just I went to the next fruiting tree and I just waited at that, and eventually they came. And uh, and I was able to get this. And what's nice too is I can position myself already based on how I want the sun to be. If I want front lighting, side lighting, or back lighting, like we started the talk with, then. I can position myself without worrying about scaring the bird away if I know they're going to come here eventually. And then, and then all I have to do is wait for the bird. And I don't have to be in full camp. I'm just, I was sitting in plain clothes like this. Um, but if, if I'm not moving a ton and not making a ton of noise, then the birds uh, just accept you into, into their habitat. And then I will uh, end the section. I think I'm in the intersection of this way is, uh, Art Wolf, who's a famous wildlife photographer, he has, he once famously said, or I think it's, it's pretty poignant, is the easiest place to photograph a duck is in a city pond. Uh, I've noticed this behavior a lot, like this duck would behave very differently on its migration route um, in an area that gets hunted versus an urban park. So photograph it where it's easiest to photograph. This is in a city pond, there's like 50 people around. This bird is acting a lot more calm there and allows me to approach. I was actually sitting in the water for the shot uh, rather than in an area where I have to try to sneak up on it from like 300 yards out because there's people who shoot it. Okay, and then the last section, I know we're getting uh, close on the six hour mark. I don't wanna keep people too late though, although I'm happy to answer questions is um, ethics. And so there's just a few things I want to point out just because it's important to me. And I think especially because I'm teaching you guys this, it's really important to talk about. There's certain situations that just have to be approached with extreme sensitivity. I don't generally photograph birds on nests. This was a bird I walked by. Um, but you can photograph birds at nests, but then you definitely want to be on a blind um, you know, you'd want to enter that blind before sunrise and generally en exit it after sunset. The last thing you want to do is push that bird off of its nest and a whole clutch of, of birds uh, are lost because of your actions. I mean, we love birds, so let's protect them and not be the reason why there's fear of them. Um, playback, you know, there's probably, I don't know, about the philosophies of playback and birding. I think in bird photography, in my opinion, I mean, ethics is, it's not black and white. It's its a grayscale, like everything in life, but this, these are choices you just have to make. I just, I'm just gonna tell you what I recommend based on, on, on my um, observations. Playback in photography to me is also kind of a no-no just because, um, you know, you're causing the bird to expend energy to come to you closer to you rather than you just having put in the energy to wait or to understand its behavior to know how to get close to it. Um, so let the bird do its thing and, and don't have it come to you if, if you don't need to do that. So bird, this is a photo about Axon or Prestel. Um, you know, bird feeders, I think, based on, and Serena, correct me if I'm wrong, or anybody, you guys know this stuff better than I do. Um, to, in my, what I've read on in primary literature and scientific literature, uh, bird feeders are not a problem for birds. They're, they're an ad, uh, we're not causing them any issues. So, you know, if you wanna shoot birds around bird feeders, you can even set up sticks here so they can land on them and you can get some nice natural portraits of them. That's no problem. Uh, that's to me, that's not a, an issue with ethics. This, on the other hand, is a big one. Um, this is even promoted by some workshop leaders, is these amazing shots of snowy owls, great, uh, gray owls, boreal owls. The way this photo is derived is somebody buys a pet mouse in a pet store that's alive, puts it on the snow, and then, and then, um, 
the snowy owl gets it. A couple of problems with that for me personally, you're killing a live animal for the sake of a photograph. Uh, if that animal escapes, could be introducing pathogens into that environment. And a scientific primary literature has found that the owls are actually at a higher risk of mortality than in, non, in areas where they're not fed um, because they're much more likely to be struck by vehicles because obviously photographers, you know, they drive up on the roads, they put the mouse out close to the road and then these owls hang out near the roads. So um, this is a big, big no-no and please, um, you know, I would highly encourage you to not engage in this, in this practice. But to end on a nice note, here's a beautiful, colorful photo of a rainbow lorikeet from Australia. Awesome, thank you. Well, we do have a few more questions if you have a few more yeah. minutes to stay on. Great. So one of them that came in was uh, regarding the workshop. Will you be speaking about advantages of shooting in RAW versus JPEG? Um, we can definitely address that. Um, I, I don't have a special section for it, but um, but I can definitely address it. I can even show an example of a JPEG versus RAW and why there's advantage to shoot in RAW. Awesome. And then I think one of your photos that was towards the end, um, I think with uh, the person with the, I think when you were talking about playback, uh, it might have been uh, that. Question. Yeah. Um, is that in the Presidio? Lobos Creek with GGNRA. Yeah, that's uh, that's David Luther. He's uh, studying white crown sparrows. This was uh, this was actually an assignment for Bay Nature. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys are more serious about this, but Bay Nature is a great resource, local resource. They need photographs. They pay for photographs. They even pay for assignment work. Um, so this was just a little quick assignment, half day shoot for me to photograph David's research who was studying white crown sparrows because they, uh, and, and uh, I think it was even covered in a David Attenborough um, show recently, they call it a different pitch than white crown sparrows outside of the Presidio because to overcome the city noise. Um, so that's what he was studying there. Nice. And then uh, another question related to ethics was what about use of flash? What is uh, your opinion on that? Right. Um, depends on the species, depends on the situation, you know, if it's night versus daytime. Um, yeah, I can give you my opinion. But yeah, it just really depends on the on this. I don't tend to use flash for nocturnal species. Um, if I am, then I'm don't have it on my camera. I have it way off on the way off the camera, so it's not directly shining at the bird. It's coming from an angle, and so it's not hitting them directly in the face. But I mean, this is this is the hard part about ethics. It's you know, again, it's not super straightforward. It's a, it's a decision that you have to be comfortable with, and all I can say is I recommend you talk to experts. Um, that's what I do. I talk to the biologists and I'm, whenever I'm photographing a certain species and if I'm not sure, I just don't do it. But if, if my assignment is to photograph, I don't know, uh, a now species and they're nocturnal and I need to get photos of them at night, then I'll talk to a biologist and be like, all right, what are my possibilities here? And what do you think is safe? That's I kind of, you know, seek, seek information from people who, who know more. Thanks, that's really helpful. And then uh, the next question is, do lens wraps work? Wraps? So is that camouflage wraps? I'm assuming that's that's the only kind of wrap I know. Um, I mean, you know, it never hurts to camouflage anything. Um, so I, um, I'd also, I used to have my lens with camouflage, like it's um, neoprene is the fabric. And um, it also helps if you're shooting a, a uh, with a darker lens, like a black lens, it absorbs the, the sun rays, the heat from the sun rays can affect 
the the sharpness of the lens. So by using camouflage wrapping there, you can uh, minimize that a little bit. It also just protects your lens. The only problem I have with is they're ninety dollars, and I realize that's ridiculous because those lenses are like anywhere between a thousand and thirteen thousand dollars. So it's like how are you complaining about ninety dollars? But it just seems ridiculous. <laughs> Maybe that's just me being frivolous. <laughs> So I've made my own. If you're good with a sewing machine, you can do that. Cool. And then uh, we have some more questions related to equipment. So do you have any recommendations for a good starter camera for a birder looking to upgrade from a phone camera? From a phone camera. OK. So I think the best way I can do, break this question down is maybe by budget. So if you want to spend $1,000 or less, then just buy the intra Canon, the intra Nikon with a 75 to 300 millimeter lens. Okay. Um, if, if, if you, if you think, okay, this is something, you know, like I love birds. I, I definitely want to get some better photos of them. Then it, and your budget basically up to $2,000 would be get a used camera on eBay or Craigslist or whatever you feel Facebook marketplace and get a new 100 to 400 millimeter lens. At that point, you had 400 millimeters. It's a great lens. I mean, the quality is it's super great. It's professional. You don't, you can't get better quality with that zoom range. And by using a, a uh, by buying a used body, you are saving yourself a lot of money um, by um, by not having the latest and greatest model. And then if your budget is higher than that then I would say, I mean, I think the dream, the dream setup right now for bird photographers just to kind of cover the spectrum is using either a Sony mirrorless camera or a Canon mirrorless camera with the 100 to 400 lens or higher lenses like 500 or 600 millimeter lenses. The reason those mirrorless cameras are so good is because their autofocus speed is insanely good. You can, you know, we can point at a swallow and actually get a sharp photo, which would have been impossible a couple of years ago. Not impossible, just very difficult. Nice. And um, I guess a related question is in terms of trying to select a good camera besides, uh, or yeah, I guess in terms of selecting a good camera, what aspects do you think are most important? Yeah, great question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say the most important stuff for bird photography is autofocus uh, abilities. And for those, you just have to read up on, it's really cumbersome, but sometimes you can even just type in best wildlife photography camera. Um, again, right now, I would say the Sony mirrorless or the Canon mirrorless have the best autofocus abilities. If you don't want to go the mirrorless route, then, um, then any of the higher end Canon or Nikon bodies will will uh, have those have, will have high good autofocus speeds. That is also dependent on your lens. But um, other other things, high frame rate is another thing you want. You know, um, to that's a good feature to have for your camera, and um, high ISO capabilities. So especially if you're shooting, you know, around sunrise, sunset, there's not a ton of light but it's when it's the most beautiful light, then you want your camera to produce photos that aren't too noisy. And so having a camera that has high ISO capabilities will do that job. Awesome. Um, we did have a question asking about a specific camera, if you're familiar with it, um, if you'd recommend the Nikon Coolpix P1000. I don't know if you have an experience with that. Um, give me another question while I look that one up. Um, well, I, I actually think that is the last question okay. for now, but... <laughs> well, the P1000 you said, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd ha I don't know it. And then just based on looking at it really quickly, I can't tell you. Um, but if that person wants to email me, that's, that's totally fine. Um, you can give them, you can just put my email in the chat too. Okay, awesome. Um, oh, and then a follow-up question was, uh, if you have recommendations for sensor size? 
Um, no, I mean, yeah, I understand these. It's so difficult, right? Because there's no one fit all. But, um, you know, generally, I would say, I mean, either crop sensor or a full frame sensor, it does, it's best whatever you have. I shot with all of it. I've, I've had high resolution, low resolution, large pixel camera, large pixels for each dot, small pixels for each dot. It's whatever, I mean, there is no right answer. Again, oh. All right, so we can see if, okay, hello. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. I don't know if you guys can see me. My computer died. <laughs> That's why I got trying to do it outside. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, you generally, I, I would say anything around a 20 megapixel camera is fantastic. But again, I sh shot with eight megapixel cameras for a long time with totally fine. The biggest, biggest thing is patience and uh, understanding behavior. Awesome, okay. I think uh, that is the last question we have for now. So um, if anyone else comes up with questions, please feel free to send them along to me or I'll be sending the link to your website and people will be able to contact you. So uh, thank you so much, Sebastian. This was amazing. And I loved seeing all your photos. Just each one was so captivating. Um, and we really look forward to your workshop. I hope, uh, you know, many of you will be able to join for that. Should be great. So, uh, Sebastian, any last things you want to share with everyone before we sign off? Um, I think the last thing I'll just say is enjoy it. You know, like you don't have to be an award-winning photographer right off the bat. Just enjoy, remember why you wanted to do it in the first place. You love birds, enjoy the birds. It's an opportunity for you to be outside. It's an opportunity for you to learn more about birds and, um, and have fun. There's lots of resources out there, whether this upcoming workshop or others. Um, of course, I'd love to see you for this workshop, but yeah, it's a great community of people and um, yeah, have fun with it. All right, thank you so much. And I hope all of you have a great rest of your evening. <laughs>